Hey traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Wednesday, April 8, 2020. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. What do we have on the docket today? They're actually making things look very similar to a duck. We'll get more into that later. We're going to look around the horn. We're going to look at all the charts we need to. We're going to look at all the markets we need to. We're going to assess assess the situation, see where we're at, and see where the next major move is likely coming from. We'll take a look at some intraday charts. We'll have some lesson learned. We had some serious money made today from inside the numbers. I'll show you the notes. You can make your own assessment. What would have happened had you been inside the numbers? Let's start with the big picture. What jumps off the page? What's the first thing that comes to mind when you look at the daily chart? First thing is, we spiked above yesterday's high. Remember yesterday we had the gap and crap. Let's take a detour and talk a little bit more about yesterday. What did they do yesterday? They ran up, filled a gap, crapped out into the close doing what? Making as many traders and investors as possible believe that the run was over, they're going to recollapse, go back and at least test the lows, make significantly new lows that's what everybody wanted to believe that's what the bears want to believe they always want to believe in lower lows there's a time to be bearish there's a time not to be bearish there's a time to be bullish and there's a time to be somewhat in between on both sides of the fence we're in the risk business there's times to go all out on the risk curve there's times to dip your toe on the risk curve There's times to keep your cash in your account or in your back pocket. Remember, the market's job is to make as many traders and investors look like fools as much of the time as possible. The objective yesterday was to make it look like that was it. There's a failure on tap. It could have certainly been a failure. It could be a failure tomorrow for all we know. We had a number on the docket. The number was 263. As long as they were above 263, the bulls are in charge. Below 263, no dice. That was a good guideline. It's a way we were able to keep it simple. They stayed above 263. Here we are. Now, what does here we are mean? In other words, here we are, meaning are we going higher? If we go higher, where are we going? Does the 281 stand? Yeah, we're likely to find resistance overhead resistance in and around 281 but is that going to be the ultimate target not if it's actually a duck here we go again with the duck conversation what the hell is he talking about it's very simple we like to keep things simple around here if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck there's a pretty good probability it's a duck 80 20 rule specifies that 20 percent of the time somewhere in and around there it's not actually going to be a duck It's either going to be a real ugly duck or it's going to be wearing a duck mask and it's going to be something else. The point is, the majority of the time, using the 80-20 rule, if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, talks like a duck, you know the routine, it's just a duck. Which means in a case like this, if it looks like yesterday was just a fake out, suck the bears back in, get them to buy the puts, then they do what? They have to cover the puts or sell the puts, creating what? Panic buying. What does panic buying create? Creates higher prices. What do higher prices create? Momentum folks hop on board. What happens then? FOMO kicks in. The FOMO folks end up buying high, hoping to sell higher, pushing price higher. All that is a simple recipe for a short squeeze slash panic buying. Is 281 likely to be the end if we get a short squeeze, a real, true, hard and fast short squeeze, pie in the face, cream on top, the whole nine yards? Now, keep in mind, we already had a short squeeze from somewhere in here when shorts started to cover up to here. A lot of that is a short squeeze. Here's a pullback. This was the B leg. Here's our C leg. But... Is this a short squeeze or was this just price going higher, climbing the proverbial wall of worry? Today was just a grind. Today is not a short squeeze. Yesterday was just a gap and crap, not really a short squeeze. 
more like institutionals selling into the gap up yesterday. You don't really know whether that's the case. It's just something that happens more often than not when you see that type of gap in crap. It's called institutional distribution. However, if we're going to see another short squeeze, don't be so sure they're not already on board. After all, they're the ones that sucked in the bears to buy puts yesterday, specifically into the closing bell, figuring we were going to get a huge gap down, another collapse, and they were going to get the payday. It hardly ever happens like that. 263 is still our line in the sand in the southern direction or down below. There's obviously stuff in between that would prevent anybody from staying in a long position all the way down to 263. That's reserved for intraday activity and inside the numbers members. So here's the deal. Let's say the duck does exist. What's the duck? The duck is another short squeeze, higher prices sooner than later, like whether it's tomorrow or Monday. Keep in mind the market's closed on Friday. But it's definitely a sooner than later type of scenario. If in fact we did see that short squeeze, I'm not so sure 281 would be the ultimate destination. I would think they would fill the gap up above, call it 285 for argument's sake, we'll call 281 a way station if I'm right. How does this all begin to take place? Well, at this point, now you've got to have hourly closes for starters above today's high. Before today, we needed first hourly closes above yesterday's high. We got above yesterday's high toward the end of the day today, but they couldn't sustain the move into the closing bell. Let's discuss the intraday stuff. Before we do that, let's bring over inside the numbers, and what I'm going to do here is basically run pretty quickly through the notes. You can pause the video, read them at your own pace. We'll take a quick look at stocks on the move, and I'll highlight a couple of things inside the numbers throughout the day, and then we'll go back to the charts and you can see whether or not I was right or wrong. Those interested will pause the video and read the notes. Those that aren't will just blow right past it, and that's fine. It works for everybody. Basically, the crux of the morning is we're looking for the early morning shakeout. You saw a peak at Stocks on the Move. We might as well bring them into view. We only had one that hit its price objective today. It was PDD. We'll take a look at the chart of that one also. But let's go ahead and go back to the notes from inside the numbers, and you'll see the early thoughts. We're focused on big picture stuff, and then as the day gets underway, we're able to whittle it down to a much narrower range where we know above is one thing, below is something else. We have stuff to work with. We want to lay out the bull case. We want to lay out the bear case. The bear case is a simple retracement of a tail candle. And if you don't know what I'm referring to there, it was from the S&P E-mini futures contract. They created a tail candle yesterday. So we were on the lookout for a retracement and a failure, which would have brought price lower. However, a retracement and a not failure is a whole different ball game. So in a sense, if the tail candle is not going to be a sign or signal of the market reversing and going lower, then what's going to happen if that doesn't happen? Then it's going to continue higher. So we know what we have to work with, we know what happens if, and we know what happens if not. So we're on that early in the morning. We're on the lookout for the shakeout, the Johnny Come Latelys. Who are they? They're the folks that want to hop on the bus thinking price is going to continue higher at the open and then they get shaken out. They're the weak hands. The weak hands get shaken out in the shakeout. It happens all the time. Not every day, but it happens all the time. It's an awareness. We want to be aware of it because we can identify a support area. If it's in fact just a shakeout and we can identify a support area, we're able to step in buy the market, whether you buy the spiders itself, you buy one of the exchange traded products, options, it doesn't make any difference. We have traders that buy all kinds of stuff in order to take advantage 
of the commentary. So we knew where the support area was, and if you're interested to learn where that is, you can read the notes because we just passed it. And we knew where it was wrong. We had a gap that was a safety net. We knew that if Price was going to fill the gap, that bullish would have been to get out of there in a hurry, bearish would have been to hang around down there, that would have told a different tale. So we know both sides of the tape, we know if it's in fact a shakeout, we know where the support is, traders that are interested to step in looking for higher prices, that's what the schematic says above what? Above 263. Then they're able to take advantage of that information, make their own decision, make their own trade, and if you're in the risk business, Today was one of those days where if you took the risk down near the morning lows when it looked like a failure and the flip side of what it looked like was simply what it was, was just a shakeout. The rest of it is pretty much history. You can read the notes, see where we were in terms of resistance areas, important numbers, numbers that showed up again, numbers we weren't surprised to see, numbers we were informed about ahead of time, moving right along. Speaking of... Look at the 211 post, 271.48. Remember that from yesterday? Well, here we were again today. And you'll see that when we go back to the charts and how it was important once again. The more often a number proves to be important, the more often we can use it as a guideline until it's no longer important. Moving right along. We're going to get back to the charts in a moment. I just want you to be able to see whatever notes you may be interested in reading, and there's the end. So with all that, you can decide for yourself whether inside the numbers is something that would benefit you during the trading day if, in fact, you're active during the trading day. Now, let's talk Turkey. Here's a five-minute chart. Everything to the right of the vertical line is today's trading activity. Yesterday's closing price was 265.10. They gapped up in the morning, and then they sold them off. The sell-off was the shakeout. We had identified support. You can go back and read in the notes where that was. The numbers used at the time consisted of the ES contract. So here's an example, 2660 to 2665. There was also a gap down below. We discussed that. But here's the general area where the market found support and never looked back. It took off from there. Now, back to the five-minute chart. Let's talk about some other stuff. Remember the 271.48. After the shakeout and the mid-morning or early morning pivot that was made, and you'll find that in the notes also, we're looking for it. Doesn't happen every day like that, but we know what happens the majority of the time. So what I'm doing is I'm putting forth what the read of the market is based on what happens the majority of the time based on what the read of the market is. You have to put everything together. It's full stack. But here's the deal. Not only did the market get sucked right up to 271.48 A because it's an important number or price area, but B, time is more important than price and the reason why it didn't continue to get sucked past 271.48, it went up there on time. Those of you that have taken the course at Lazy E-Mini Trader will notice, A, I'm not using the chart that's taught in the course, and B, if you go back to the course, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about from the mid-morning low or from the pivot low up to 271.48 was on time. There's a good reason why it didn't just bust through and needed to eat some time off the clock following reaching 271.48. How does a trader use that information? If a trader was long from any point below that, that would have been an exit point. Doesn't have to be the entire position, but it has to be an exit figuring the market's going to take a break and we're going to have some kind of a pullback from that area. The pullback was very shallow. However, you don't know that at the time. All this factors into how we run this as a business. The rest of it's already on the screen. It's pretty obvious. The 274.36, or really what was yesterday's high at 275.03, was the next real important area. You can see here the high happened to be 274.41. So I think my 36 or 274.36 was pretty spot on on the first run back up there. 
Here's the pullback. The trip trap fool and frustrate crew has to get involved going back and forth into the end of the day. You'll also find that in the commentary, we have to watch out for stuff at the end of the day. You could have a jam session with another short squeeze making new highs, which they did for a brief moment, or you can have a mini trap door open thinking that it's a failure and that's what happens before the run up. Yesterday, they had the opposite. Yesterday, they ran up and then killed them into the close rather than today where they jammed them up a little bit, but they couldn't really sustain it, still going out bullish on the day. Before we wrap up the S&P 500, I want to bring something back to everybody's attention, something we discussed last week, when things looked rather dire. Remember what we discussed. We said things would start to look better. They would start to begin discussing, or they would continue discussing therapies, vaccines. They would begin discussing how things aren't necessarily as bad as we thought they were going to be, All that is taking place, hence you're seeing the market climb the wall of worry. The bears don't necessarily understand how that phenomenon works. We didn't talk about that after it was taking place. We talked about that before it took place so that you had an awareness and that you would be pre-prepared. The same is down here looking for a low. We weren't looking for a further collapse. We were looking for a low. Nobody believed it. They never do. Just like nobody believes the market can continue higher. That's, in a sense, what creates the wall of worry. Remember something else we talked about down here. We said the Fed will pump in as much money as necessary until the market turns. What are we up to by now? Four, five, six trillion dollars? Who's even counting anymore? It doesn't matter what's been pumped in, what is yet to be pumped in. It doesn't matter what they're buying or not buying. What matters is, does everybody believe the Fed is there to save the day? There will come a time when they can't save the day, but that's what everybody believes. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy until it's not. Right now, the schematic is working. What's going on over in Camp IWM? Any new information? Do we need to know anything? Looks similar. They peaked their head above yesterday's high. Didn't close above yesterday's high. Looks bullish. Other than some kind of black swan event and a gap down in the morning, we're expecting higher prices. That's what the duck says. 20% of the time, it's not going to be a duck. Right now, it walks like a duck. It talks like a duck. It looks like a duck. Right now, it's a duck. As hard as it is to believe, the duck is crossing the street. Transports, same routine, second favorite market leading indicator. And by the way, the IWM, number one favorite market leading indicator, let's go back over there, was up 4.68% today, leading the charge. It was leading earlier. You also saw that in the notes from inside the numbers. You have to take a look around the horn. The second favorite market leading indicator was also up strongly, ending the day on par with the S&P, but it looks like the IWM. Looks like they're trying to break loose. They didn't get above yesterday's high, but we're not going to split hairs over stuff like that. We're going to look at the big picture and we're going to say, is the big picture a duck or not? Right now, the duck is on the table. And it's not lost on me. We've got bears pounding the unsubscribe button. We've got bears pounding the dislike button. I get it. We've been here before. The cues. The folks out in Silicon Valley. Little bit of a different look in the cues. Nowhere near yesterday's high. That's interesting in and of itself. It goes on the bear side of the ledger. It's a puzzle piece, and it is on the table. They did, however managed to recapture the 200 period moving average, which they spiked above but failed at yesterday. So that's something, but doesn't look the same as the IWM, doesn't look the same as the transports, doesn't look the same as the spider. Is it a divergence that's going to catch up later? Maybe so. For now, it's a puzzle piece. We have to be the umpire calling balls and strikes. How about the XLF? Now look at this. Yesterday's high happens to be 22.22. Today's high happens to be 22.33, a close at 22.19. 
They're playing around with yesterday's high, just as they are in other markets. Just wanted to point it out using this chart. There are no accidents, no coincidences in the market. There's either going to be a colossal failure and I'm the one with the pie in the face, or it's just a duck not ready to cross the street yet. SMH, it's kind of a tweener. We know what the tweener thing is. Doesn't look as bad as the Qs. Doesn't look as good as some others. But like it did on the Qs, it's a recapture of the 200 period moving average. Up 3% today. Still a strong day across the board. Not everything's going to be up the same amount. Not everything is going to look the same on every chart, which is why we use a variety of charts. Hence the term analysis. Analysis isn't looking at a three-minute chart and saying, hey, looks like this is happening, let's hop on board. That's not analysis, that's just gambling. I had a request to cover a couple of things that we just don't cover all that often. The first one we'll discuss is gold. We're just going to take the long view, and what I'll say is the same thing I've been saying for months and months and months, which is gold is on a long-term breakout. What does that mean? Over a long period of time, we're expecting higher prices in gold, which means it's an investment if you're so inclined to hold gold. That being said, if you do that, you're going to have to withstand the pullbacks. As we know with gold, the pullbacks can be fast, violent, and large. So can the rallies. Here's a weekly chart. So for example, is it out of the question for gold to come back or at least work its way back down toward the 20 period moving average, which is also known as what? And this is for the newcomers out there, home base. The market doesn't really like to get too far extended away from home base. So we call the 20 period moving average home base. Where's the 20 period moving average? It's the red trend line. So right now that's at 1574 and change. That's a moving target. We're in an uptrend, so that will continue to move up along with time. How about silver? Completely different chart. Here's the monthly chart. It's not in a long-term breakout. It may be at some point in the future, but that's not what the chart is saying today. Why the big divergence between gold and silver? Don't they generally trade together? Well, they do a lot trade together. However, I would only say one thing, and I don't really subscribe to any of this stuff, but silver, also known in part as an industrial metal, if we're seeing a slowdown in the economy over the long term, then it would make sense that nobody wants to own silver for the long term. But there's a lot of other reasons to own silver, and I hate that stuff. I never really subscribe to all those ancillary stories surrounding a stock or a commodity, or an investment, or whatever it is. Those are known as like story stocks. You take a $2 stock, you wrap a story around it, and you sell it. That's what brokers used to do in the old days. The penny stock brokers, they have what they call story stocks. A biotech that's coming out with the next greatest thing. It's 12 cents. It's going to be $90 in a couple of years. Those are story stocks. I'm not looking to build a story around bullish or bearish behavior of anything. All I'll say about silver is until it can actually get above and close above 17 for starters, there's no dice. Have I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you and that without you, these videos are not possible? True and accurate information. I'm going to use this opportunity to pull the ripcord here. It's everything I wanted to and intended to discuss today. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.